This episode of Real Engineering is brought to you by Skillshare, home to over 20,000 classes that could teach you a new life skill. The Ford Model T was not the first car, not even close. Depending on how you define what a car is, that honor was achieved 100 years before Henry Ford was even born in 1769, when French engineer Nicolas Joseph Cuneau created this steam-powered vehicle designed to travel off-rail. The honor for the first true automobile goes to Carl Benz, founder of Mercedes-Benz in 1885, with this single-piston, two-stroke, gasoline-powered vehicle. The art of the automobile was well under development before Henry Ford hit the scene. No, Ford did not invent the automobile. He invented something much more profound. He created modern society. That is a massive claim, but bear with me. His manufacturing techniques did not just revolutionize how we design and build everything, making complicated machinery like tractors and cars affordable for the masses. His manufacturing techniques radically changed the trajectories of billions of people's careers. At the turn of the 18th century, craft manufacturing was the status quo, defined by a highly skilled workforce. People wishing to pursue a career in automotive manufacturing entered their career and progressed through an apprenticeship, picking up a huge variety of skills, gradually learning the tricks of the trade and being masters of their craft. Many would go on to run their own machine shops. These were less employees and more contractors. In these days, a machine like an automobile was not built entirely in-house. Parts would come from smaller machine shops from all over the city. They used general purpose tools and machines to create the parts needed, which would be sent to the final assembler. These parts would vary massively from one batch to another, requiring a skilled assembling team. Workers needed to understand the function of the part they were working on and skillfully manipulate the parts together into the final vehicle. There was no mass manufacturing of complex machines like this. Each vehicle was one of a kind, commissioned by whoever was wealthy enough to afford it. At this production volume, no company could create a monopoly. There were hundreds of small craft shops like this across Western Europe and North America, but many would soon be run out of business by Henry Ford before they had the chance to adopt his mass manufacturing techniques. Only the best craft manufacturers survived. Companies like Aston Martin and Bentley succeeded by focusing on the ultra-wealthy that could afford these one-off vehicles, using skilled craftsmen to build unique and luxurious cars. But even they would soon have to join the movement to survive, all eventually being bought out by these mass production powerhouses, no longer able to keep up with the cost of innovation and manufacturing required to keep pace in the automotive industry. At the high point of the Model T's success in 1923, Ford was manufacturing 2.1 million Model T's a year, a figure that would only be matched by a single vehicle model again with the VW Beetle. Many people chalk Henry Ford's success down to inflexibility in design. The famous quote, you can have any colour as long as it's black. This was true for many years, but perhaps not for the reasons you think. You see, Henry Ford was obsessed with manufacturing speeds. The painting process he used allowed the paint to dry quickly, and it was only available in black at that time. He shaved time off wherever possible to achieve that monumental milestone of 2.1 million Model Ts a year. The Model T was no fluke. It was the culmination in over 20 design iterations over five years, each one tweaking the design and manufacturing procedure to cut seconds off the total process. And the innovations continued through the nearly 20 years of production that would see a total of 15 million Model Ts manufactured. Ford worked all his life to learn the skills needed to achieve this goal, which you can learn more about by watching this video by my friends over at Business Casual. But we will start our story on the first day of production for the Model T in 1908. The average task cycle for the Model T on that day lasted 514 minutes. The task cycle time is the length of time before a single task is repeated. So the average worker did not repeat a task for eight and a half hours. For Ford, this was essentially how long a single production line was producing vehicles, as assembly lines cannot start a new vehicle until another has exited at the other end. So he set to work on reducing that cycle time, and by 1913, he managed to bring it down to just 2.3 minutes. For a product this complex, consisting of hundreds of parts, with hundreds of processes, that is astounding and was something no other company had ever achieved. How on earth did Ford achieve this quantum leap forward in manufacturing speed? Let's first start with the innovations that Ford was not responsible for that allowed him to begin this journey. As I said, one of the reasons highly skilled workers were essential to these industries before Ford came along was because of the high variability between parts. In engineering, we call this tolerancing. 
When I worked as a design engineer, I needed to specify the tolerances I needed for specific part features. Say I needed a shaft to fit a particular hole, I needed to specify how much the machinist was permitted to deviate from the listed dimension. If I have a 20mm hole paired with a 19mm shaft, and I specify that both can deviate from that dimension by plus or minus 0.5mm, even at the extreme ends of both, where both are 19.5mm wide, they will still fit with some force. This may not be acceptable depending on application, and higher tolerancing may be needed, which generally means an increase in cost. Engineers screw up these things even today, but in Ford's day, consistently achieving a tolerance that tight in mass manufacturing would have been a huge task and was generally something saved for military applications and not for low-cost consumer products. This was largely due to the mass manufacturing techniques of the day, specifically heat treatment methods. As explained in my knife forging and aluminium videos, metals need to be heated and cooled in specific ways to strengthen or harden the metal. But this makes the metal much harder to cut and shape, so the metals were often cut first and heat treated after. This heating and cooling causes the metal to deform due to the thermal expansion, which can then throw the original piece out of tolerance. This is called warping and it made it nigh on impossible to get a consistent final product. Many attribute Ford with revolutionizing the standardization of parts, but in truth, he was simply at the right place at the right time to benefit from technologies that facilitated it. New methods for cutting and stamping pre-hardened metals allowed Ford to eliminate much of this variability due to warping. Advancements in precision measurement and manufacturing allowed Ford to be confident that parts would be interchangeable, and in turn, this allowed Ford to design his vehicles in a way that reduced costs. This was the dawn of destruction for the craft manufacturing industry and the beginning of a movement that would change the face of modern society. While his competitors were casting each cylinder of their engine block separately and bolting them together, due to the difficulty in casting a single part with multiple holes that needed to line up precisely, Ford casted a single complex engine block that drastically reduced the time required to manufacture and assemble it. And this, of course, led to incredibly expensive dedicated machinery needed to manufacture a single piece of the vehicle. In the world of craft manufacturing, a skilled worker could use a general purpose tool and skillfully use it to produce the final product. In the world of mass manufacturing, this was not acceptable. It took too long and required skilled workers who were too difficult to replace. For example, engine blocks consist of an upper and lower part that need to mate perfectly to maintain a seal for engine compression. Ford's competitors, like Cadillac, used a single flexible milling machine to create a flush surface on both the upper and lower halves of the engine block. Engine blocks and heads were loaded and milled slowly and precisely one at a time. Ford instead created dedicated machines to mill engine blocks and engine heads separately, 15 and 30 at a time respectively. Workers simply snapped the unmilled pieces into a tray while the previous lot was being milled and then pushed the tray into place when the time came. A worker could be trained in five minutes to do this task. They didn't need to speak the same language as the person next to them. They didn't need to think about anything else. Just feed the machine. Like the little butter passing robot of Rick and Morty. What is my purpose? You pass butter. Oh my God. These people had a single purpose. This of course resulted in inflexibility in design. The cost of introducing an entirely new model vehicle was drastically increased. And this is why even today, car brands tend to iterate on old designs rather than introduce entirely new models. It's simply too expensive and time consuming to retrofit entire production lines. When Ford eventually decided to completely redesign the Model T and produce the Model A, these machines were thrown out, but he had achieved his goal. Cycle times were lowering and there was still room to improve. Ford managed to half cycle times from 2.3 minutes to 1.2 minutes with his next innovation. When production first started on the Model T, employees worked from a stationary work stand. If they needed a part or tool, they would get up and get it themselves. Ford soon recognized the waste and introduced dedicated stock suppliers, whose only job was to ensure that other workers had the parts they needed to keep production running at a constant pace. Where possible, these employees were replaced with automated supply lines. This idea grew and evolved to the introduction of Ford's greatest manufacturing innovation, the moving assembly line. A manufacturing technique still in use today, even for huge machines like planes. 
This is Boeing's moving assembly line for the 777, which carries the entire 166-ton plane across the factory floor, gradually adding the 3 million parts needed to complete it. This method introduces a sense of urgency to the factory floor, an ever-looming deadline to complete your work before the plane reaches the next production step. If there is a critical problem, the entire production line will literally stop moving until it's fixed. Ford was not the first to introduce such an idea. They had been used in simple production lines for butchering of carcasses and food preparation before, but never for anything this complex, and Ford applied it as a science, using his engineering skills to help pioneer a new branch of engineering, industrial engineering. A branch of engineering mostly concerned with optimizing the logistics of manufacturing. Spend a few hours playing Factorio and you will really gain an appreciation for the complexity of this profession. It starts off simple, but as your factory grows, you need to carefully manage production speeds to avoid pileups. You need to plan and place your production units to maximize transportation speeds and get the products where they need to be. One of the huge problems you run into is faster production units producing items faster than you need them further up the line, causing pileups of stock that can back up and actually block other production units. Before you know it, production has grinded to a halt. The moving assembly line forces all workers to work at the same pace. Faster workers can't produce items faster than they are needed, and slower workers can't slack off. Ford's innovations catapulted the Ford Motor Company to international success, but that dominance would not last forever. Companies came from all over the world to observe Ford's factories. They marveled at how the factory itself was like a finely tuned machine, each part feeding into the other. They took their lessons home, and by 1955, mass manufacturing had proliferated around the world, and soon companies outside the US were not just catching up with the big three of Detroit, Ford, General Motors and Cadillac, but far exceeding their capabilities. Most notably, Toyota in post-World War II Japan, who led a revolution in manufacturing through a new manufacturing philosophy, lean manufacturing. And this graph shows all vehicles produced by region after 1955, showing the explosion and growth in Japan with the advent of lean manufacturing that would lead to Detroit's eventual demise. Detroit would soon become a ghost town, and just as these companies viewed their machines as disposable, they viewed their employees as disposable, dropping them the moment demand tanked. This problem has only got worse. Zero hour contracts and strict control of unions is common. Ford actually paid his workers incredibly well for the time, but that meant little when demand dropped and these workers had few transferable skills to gain new employment. For better or worse, Ford's innovations completely changed the job market for billions of people. I was one of those people, working 12-hour shifts with only one task, weigh a stent and pass it to the next step. During that time, I made extra efforts to learn new skills outside of work to keep myself sane. One way to learn new skills is through Skillshare, and why not start by learning about the stock market with this course from my friends at Business Casual, who have also just made a video about Henry Ford's rise to success on their channel. This is just one in over 20,000 classes you could take on Skillshare that range from creative skills like painting and music lessons to technical skills like coding. With professional and understandable classes that follow a clear learning curve, you can dive in and start learning how to do the work you love. A premium membership begins around $10 a month for unlimited access to all courses, but the first 1,000 people to sign up with this link will get their first two months for free. So ask yourself right now, what skill have you been putting off learning? What project have you been dreaming of completing but you aren't sure if you have the skills to do it? Why not start right now and sign up to Skillshare using the link below to get your first two months for free. You have nothing to lose and a valuable life skill to gain. As usual, thanks for watching and thank you to all my Patreon supporters. A link to that video by Business Casual is on screen now. If you'd like to see more from me, the links to my Twitter, Facebook, Discord server, subreddit and Instagram pages are below.